Hi everyone, good morning from Australia. This is Toby from the International Association for Political Science and we are live here from the World Congress from the uh, from IPSA, the International Political Science Association and today I'm sitting here with Stephen Sawyer. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Uh, we are very happy that uh, you are here today with us and we want to talk about uh, your current research mainly um, and your topic urban political revolt Michel Foucault and the problem of sustaining political action Great. basically these are three topics that mm -hmm. that you mention and cover uh, um, in your paper how do these three topics relate to each other so the the idea of this particular panel for the IPSA is to think about uh, the sort of three points first we know that we are living in what is oftentimes referred to as a golden age of urban protest. So we're seeing from Taksim Square to obviously Occupy, from the Endinados to the Umbrella uh, revolts in, in Hong Kong, we're seeing a kind of extraordinary level of, of urban political revolt that seems to be inaugurating uh, something new in what the city and urban environments can offer for uh, political movement. So that's that's the sort of immediate observation that a lot of people have uh, have noted. The second is a problem that has emerged from this, which, for example, another one of these movements, Nuit Debout in 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 Paris, the Place de la République. Another problem that's emerged from this is, well, how do we go from sort of these very uh, sort of fundamental and important political actions that are taking place within urban environments to something more sustained. Since a lot of them are organized around critiques of current modes of institutional or other organizational political forms. And so how do we think about sustaining that political action across time outside of these immediate moments? And you have all kinds of examples of trying to think about this. Obviously, Occupy, this was a major question. Nuit Debout in Paris, for those of you who are familiar with it, did something very interesting where they started, of course, they said the movement started on, um, uh, I believe it was March 32nd. OK, so uh, and then or March 31st and then they went and then they went through and they continued that calendar, which was an obvious sign that they're trying to think about a new relationship to time. And so that's the second observation is how do we sustain this action? And then the third, which is just one path among many. We chose that for this uh, conference, but there are many ways of thinking about this. And I've done others in other parts of my research, but it's to think about, well, Perhaps one of the people we could go to to think about this would be Michel Foucault. And Michel Foucault is not necessarily the most obvious because many people have used Michel Foucault to think about going beyond the state or beyond organization or beyond institutions. And I think that was a, that was a right move. But are there aspects of his work that could also help us to think about sustaining political action? And in particular, any relationship between uh, specific revolt, revolutionary action, forms of what he referred to as governmentality and also very original ways of thinking about institutions and feedback loops between uh, political action and other modes of power or relations of power that could be sustained over the long term. So that's sort of the three aspects of this of this particular panel. It's interesting that you um, mentioned this side of Michel Foucault already. He's yeah. he's someone who hasn't been a political scientist in a narrow uh, understanding. No, still, still he is um, used m more and more often for certain types of analysis. What exactly um, differentiates Foucault from from other researchers? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question. And Foucault, obviously, he has had an impact on a number of disciplines uh, for, uh, within the humanities and the social sciences and uh, science studies. Um, I think in this, and as I said, you know, I don't, the point in here is not to overemphasize the importance of Foucault. I don't have a larger attachment to Foucault than many other uh, theorists, but I think he uh, he does offer one path that that's worth exploring, and that. That path I would characterize as being deeply interdisciplinary and one that does not necessarily take for granted a certain set of categories within political science. So never takes for granted the idea of the state, will not take for granted the idea of a clear distinction between the economic 
and the social and the political fields, for example. He will not take for granted um, uh, certain, uh, certain modes of action or writing as being more objective than others, for example, which is also something that's very important when you're in a revolutionary moment and so many things are up for grabs, even just the ways that you can present a given statement as being true or false. So he, he, he's a useful person to look at and a particularly fecund uh, resource, again, certainly not the only one, but a fecund resource for thinking uh, at a very fundamental level because he undermines so many of our just basic categories about how an analysis like this would work. Mm -hmm. Um, thinking more about the the urban political revolt, how um, how is the modern urban political revolt different um, from from previous ones? Oh. How how can we differentiate uh, different types? Yeah, there? no, I think that's a great question. So this this taps into the larger uh, project that this particular panel is a part of, which is um, sort of looking back at previous moments. And, and in my current book project, the idea is to look at especially a period that uh, in, from 1820 to 1850, uh, in, in, especially in Europe. Now, this is a period that most people who have some familiarity with European history know, especially through the revolution of 1848. It's when Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto. Um, <clears throat> the revolution of 1830, in, in France and in Poland and Belgium, 1848 took place across uh, Europe, into Eastern Europe and even into South uh, Latin America. Um, and so these were, these are 1830 and 1848 are movements that people know about. The idea here uh, in this project is to think more about it as a, as, a, as a longer term, what I'm referring to as a revolutionary moment that might have some echoes with what we're experiencing today. That is that it wasn't just 1830, 1848. There were actually movements in 1831, 1832. People are probably familiar with Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. Well, Les Miserables is not about 1830 or 1848, which a lot of people think it is. It's about a revolution in 1832 that didn't actually change anything. It was a revolt. But there are also revolts in 1833, 1834, 1840, 1841, um, and, and 1848, 1849, 1850. And then there's this massive sort of military reaction that stretches across Europe in the 1850s. Um, and so the, this happens to also coincide with the period when the word democracy, as we currently understand it, was taking its current shape. And as many, as many sort of political scientists and historians uh, have, have shown, during the revolutionary age at the late 18th century, the word democracy had pretty bad press. Most people aren't using the term to think about their ideal political form. In fact, it's usually referring to the ancients or to some sort of mob rule. Um, starting in the 1820s, you have a new thinking. Democracy reemerges. There are a few emblematic moments, the creation of the Democratic Party in, in the US. Um, the sort of radical left in Britain starts using the term again. Radicals in, uh, in France start to use the term. Again, Tuckville puts out his Democracy in America, which is widely seen as sort of this new way of thinking about what democracy might be. And then even the early Marx is dealing with democracy in the 1840s before he moves on to a, a greater focus on capitalism. So there's this sort of moment when we have all of this revolt going on and we're also talking and starting to use a language of democracy. And what I'd like to suggest is that there's a connection there. There's something going on there between this constant wave of revolt on a whole series of public problems and a rethinking of democracy as a modern form instead of an ancient mode or a notion of mob rule. Mm -hmm. um, Still, how do you uh, how do these um, urban revolts um, uh, differ or are similar to the ones, um, especially referring to the agents involved in it? Um, because I mean, one uh, big difference from societies in the nineteenth century mm -hmm. to the twenty first century is definitely how societies, uh, the consistency of societies. Absolutely. So who's who's bringing forward? those revolts who are the agents um, also uh, maybe differentiating who are the who start the revolt and who are then uh, 
uh, taking over the reform. There are, of course, different agents over time and involved into those. Uh, yeah. No, that's a great question. I mean, I guess the, I would respond in two ways. So there's one would be a direct response to your question, which is, you know, in one sense, what are the differences between these two periods? Um, and obviously, it is necessary to go up a slight level of abstraction if you want to start looking for parallels. Mm -hmm. Now, I a lot of my work is, is focused on the idea that we can make better sense of the present by looking at the past and especially the 19th century. I think there are, are things to gain. Having said that, we obviously need to make some clear distinctions about what's going on. But let me just sort of, at, at, a, at a relatively abstract level, let me just suggest a few parallels. So one parallel is between our current wave of urban protest and, and what was going on in the 1830s and 40s, is that you're coming out of a kind of liberal response to what was perceived as a failed revolutionary moment. Okay, so in the 19th century, the way this manifests itself is largely in reaction to the terror in the French Revolution. And so you have this, and then, and Napoleon, okay? So you have this whole wave of what is the first wave of liberalism that is largely committed to saying, you know, we really went too far with this, and then it led to this kind of authoritarian despotism. And what we really need to do is come up with some sort of more uh, structured liberalism about limiting what the state can actually do. One could argue that you have something similar coming out of 1989. And in the wave of sort of liberalization, which is now generally referred to as a neoliberalization of certain fields of politics, the economy, and, and, and culture. So you do have, it's, it's at a re obviously at a very broad sort of level, but you do have a certain parallel there. The other parallel that you have is a massive transfer, transformation in the modes of communication. So in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s, you have this sort of golden age of the emergence of a new press. And that's when you're going to invent the idea that, uh, in fact, subscribers should not pay, but advertisements should pay for newspapers, for example. And the revolution of 1830 in France, the revolution of 1848 in France, and all of these revolutions in between are all deeply connected to these new modes of communication. Well, obviously what we're seeing in the present is that we're not quite sure how transformative it is, but obviously social media has provided a new outlet and a new opportunity for this. So it's not to say it's the same. It's just to say that there are ways that we can gather some perspective on what's going on. And I would say the third is that it's a real, it's a truly deep interrogation about what a modern or contemporary democracy can be about. I mean, you see this in both our present debates. You saw it with Occupy, with Nuit Debout. You see it in, in Taksim Square. You see it with the Andiniados. You see it with the Umbrella Revolt. There is an underlying conversation about what democracy in this context would look like and a, a sort of dissatisfaction with the vote, a dissatisfaction with certain modes of administrative rule, a certain dissatisfaction with a, the with a predominance of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And you have debates in the 1830s and 40s as well about dissatisfaction with the way the administration is functioning, a dissatisfaction with any attempt to isolate the economic from the political, and uh, a sort of real interrogation about whether or not the vote is the best way to, uh, to, to, to furnish a robust democracy with the resources it needs. So, so that's a very long answer, but it's an answer to sort of, obviously you do need to step up a level of abstraction, and then you have to get into the weeds and the details. But there, is a, there are certain parallels that I think can make looking back uh, of an effective way of looking forward, so to speak. Yeah, it's very interesting that you mentioned that both, both points in time actually have in common this momentum of um, getting more connected and more uh, uh, being better able to to reach other parts of, of the society, basically. Um, uh, however, there's there's because there's also a paradox that is constructed because um, a lot of these protests fail because there's also a certain disconnect in these societies in the end, and uh, that the urban political ro revolts nowadays are led by urban political elites. elites. Um, so how do you explain um, those, those disconnects that are still there, even though we have an increase of connection? Yeah. No, I think that's a very good point. And, I, and, and you see this in, in both periods as well. Although one of, 
obviously in the background one of the uh, uh, sort of takeaways from looking back to look forward is to suggest there were some major changes. Even if these revolts were not always successful, there was a major refounding and rethinking of what democracy could be. And I think that is probably what's happening. So the, so let me just answer the question in, in, in a slightly oblique way, which is to say, you're absolutely right. The disconnect seems to remain. And, and what seems to be happening is that at the same time that certain modes of mobilization are concretized. If we take, for example, Occupy, which stands as seems to stand as a real sort of uh, option for, for, for political participation today, it's when you look at what's actually happening in the United States, it would seem to be going in quite the opposite direction uh, in terms of um, many of the uh, of the of the kind of uh, policies that, that 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 specifically Donald Trump is 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 uh, is proposing, and 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 doing at some level. Um, but the question then is, what will the bottom line be after this wave of protests that starts sometime in the late two thousands and that we're still in the middle of, um, and keeping in mind that the result of this movement from 1820 to 1850 was ultimately a military reaction across Europe in the, in, uh, and some, uh, but at the same time, a, found, a new foundation for the modern state that led to uh, many of the most progressive, uh, new liberal, uh, solidarist movements, at least in the Atlantic world, in, and the construction of the modern welfare state in the late 19th century. So there, you can have sort of what look like immediate forms of very brutal and, and, and sort of um, drastic repression taking place that can then generate over the long term very different effects. And I think that's part of the idea is that we need to keep in mind the short term and the long term together. Okay, so um, I think we've we've already covered a lot of the aspects of your of yeah. your current um, research. If you look um, more on the the results uh, that also connect to the sustainability component, yeah. are there are there other things that we have to know what is important about sustainable uh, protest? Well, I think I mean I, I guess the, the the largest lesson to be learned is what are the pathways between mobilization, popular mobilization, or what we might call um, democratic mobilizations in the sense that they are extremely open. Uh, they are uh, organized around the idea of the individuals that are gathered having an impact on the current organizational structures. The, how, if we want to think about how those democratic uh, transformations can change, we're faced with, we're faced with an, an issue today. A lot of the political science and social science that was thinking about political action as revolt coming out of the 1960s, what we might refer to as the last golden age of protest, was very focused on cultural change. And the idea was at some level that there is a real opposition between the state and society and social structures can transform the state but ultimately, if we really want change, it needs to be cultural change. And I think that among political scientists, uh, sociologists of the state, sociologists more broadly, social scientists that are thinking about these questions over the last five to 10 years, there's been a general shift to suggest, well, no, we really do, cultural change is, is fundamental, but there does need to be some sort of way of establishing a relay between the robustness of political action happening on the ground and some form of organization afterwards. And I think that's the larger issue. And of course, there are ways of solving this on the, on the, on the radical left. There are ways of solving this uh, sort of in the center left and on, on the right, etc. But it does seem to be the issue of thinking about how we can democratize our, uh, further democratize a whole set of organizational structures where the vote and some of our other more traditional modes of organization seem to be, let's say, running out of steam. So I think, I think that's the, 
that's the ambition and that's that's the point that 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 uh, that that many of this much of this work is focusing on today. Mm -hmm. um, you also have a pretty interesting um, function in terms of uh, also being in the executive committee of, of IPSA and uh, uh, therefore one of the largest political science uh, associations mm -hmm. in the world. Um, can you maybe give us and our, our viewers an idea of um, how you as a researcher but also as a, as a person and then as being active in, in such an organization um, see the responsibility uh, in terms of um, uh, also uh, um, going into these developments and supporting uh, the, 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 the flow of communication, what we've just talked about, and to create some kind of, of connection between uh, these, these different parts also in a globalized world because it says it's reaching out yeah. to different parts in the world. Yeah. Um, so just to be clear, so I'm on the executive committee of the International Political Science Association uh, in in a sort of in a, in a few capacities, but primarily as uh, the editor of the International Political Science Abstracts, which are published uh, by IPSA and which provide uh, one of the largest resources for research in uh, in, in in political science. And the editors of the journals are de facto members of the executive committee. And I suppose that that may be the most obvious way of responding to, to the question that, that, that the abstracts, the reason why the, the, the editors are members of the executive committee is, is largely because we do provide a bridge between the political science community at large, between the readers, the researchers, uh, and even uh, and 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 the policy world, and uh, and IPSA, and then the executive committee. So, in one sense, we are very much sort of in almost in quotidian qu contact with uh, with the the political science community, and that is obviously something that's very important for IPSA. Right? Is that is that we can figure out constant ways of, of, of serving the, the community better, of providing opportunities for the community to come together, to develop its research, to develop its capacity, such that the discipline of political science and, and its uh, surrounding disciplines can, uh, can thrive at an international level. Obviously, the national organizations have their structures. Many of them are thriving and doing uh, extraordinary work. But IPSA um, is, is one of the rare uh, social science uh, uh, organizations that can provide a truly international perspective. And so the journals, including the International Political Science Review, World Political Science, and the abstracts, offer really that opportunity to maintain that connection and to provide the networks for those uh, researchers to stay in touch with each other. Uh, one question um, out, of, out of this, because you, you mentioned um, you're reading all these different abstracts uh, yes. coming coming out of the yeah. from the whole world, basically. Yeah. Um, this this development of, of globalizing political science is is an ongoing process. Um, what does it What does it do with the research itself in terms of quality? In terms of um, how researchers think beyond certain dimensions that they have been thinking uh, about yeah. before. How is political science research affected by this globalization process? Yeah. I, this is a this is a great question, and the uh, I, sh I should just say the we're we're currently in Brisbane for Borders and Margins uh, World Congress. The next World Congress will be in Lisbon uh, in 2020, and I believe the title is globalization and its challengers mm -hmm. or something. So very much the, the, the question that, that you're asking. And I guess I would say there are sort of three, there, there are kind of three ideas that come to mind. The first is that it is clear that the uh, IPSA was created in a very different moment of globalization than the one that we're currently experiencing. So it was very much a part of a post-war globalization moment what you might refer to as a NATO globalization movement uh, or, or, or something else, in which, um, th for example, the, the two languages of the International Political Science Association are English and, and French, for example, which is, is, is very characteristic of that post-war moment. And 
like many of the institutions created at that time, the IMF, the World Bank, a lot, a lot of these global institutions, uh, the NATO itself, the, the, the Security Council, uh, UNESCO, they are providing, a, they have continued to provide a very important service, and I would say are even more important today <laughs> in some ways than they were when a lot of the norms and the principles of, of that post-war world were sort of taken for granted. As we enter into a new phase, I think it's at this point very difficult to deny that we have entered into a new phase of uh, sort of high-powered uh, populist nationalism. The role of organizations like the IPSA is absolutely, um, it, it's impossible to understate, to overstate. It's just, it's just such a, a, a fundamental uh, place. So I would say that's, so the first point is that it was created at a different moment of globalization. The second is that those institutions created during that moment have a, have a new and more, uh, and more important role to play. And the third is that we really do kind of offer an unprecedented vehicle for um, uh, social scientists to come together. And I should just sort of say that sociology and political science are sort of far above the curve of many of the other social sciences and humanities, where the idea of having an international congress where people from all over the world come together are publishing in common journals are uh, participate such as the IPSR world politics or the abstracts is just such a rare opportunity and something the political science really needs to cherish. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have uh, right now one question by one of our followers. Alessia asks, attempts to turn urban revolts into longer term sustainable political action often comes along with compromises with the regimes these revolts often criticize. How to maintain this critical stance in the organized political action in light of the power imbalance between the civil society segments and the political or e economic establishment? Yeah. So this is this is obviously the question, and this is partially, and again, you know, it's not to sort of overstate the importance of Foucault by any stretch of the imagination. But this is why part of the inquiry at, needs to look at at theorists who have not suggested that there would be any obvious answer in the state or in some form of obvious institutional organization. That is that, but that also are still thinking about power and social or power relations as essential to any kind of social, economic, or political organization. So at that point, it, what becomes essential is to be thinking about, at least in the context of the panel that, that we put together here, is to be thinking about the idea that these moments of urban political revolt are not moments that are devoid of power. Okay, so that's the first key point. These are not I, and here I would disagree with somebody like Sheldon Wolin or others who have seen revolution and revolt as a moment almost as a return to a state of nature in which all sort of power is suspended, uh, power relations are, are suspended. We see very clearly, and anybody who's participated in one of these, uh, in an urban uh, revolt, a recent urban revolt, knows that there are still power relations at work. So then the question is, are those, are those power relations, and there are constant efforts, I know, for example, in Nuit Debout, there are constant efforts to prevent those power relations from becoming modes of domination in a traditional sense. So then the question is, how do we sustain those modes of power relations? And are there any ways of, at least if not institutionalizing, of turning those into something that is longer term. But I guess the point here is that the first step is to recognize that there are still power relations and, and, and power is still operating within these revolutionary contexts. And then starting from there, instead of starting from the idea that we are finally free of power because we are in the civil society, and then we have to confront power and destroy it, and then we will all be free. That seems to me to be the initial move that we need to make. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I hope uh, this, is, this is a sufficient and also holistic answer uh, to Alessia and everyone who's watching right yeah. now. Um, I want to thank you very much for you. being here with us today. And um, I 
uh, wish you a successful time here at the Thank IFS you. World Congress and okay. afterwards as well. It's been a pleasure. This is a wonderful organization. It's a pleasure to, uh, to participate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.